Welcome to the Human Performance Outliers podcast with your hosts, Dr. Sean Baker and Zach Bitter. At Human Performance Outliers podcast, we dive into a wide range of topics revolving around health, nutrition, and physical fitness. If you enjoy the show and wish to support us, please visit patreon.com forward slash HPO podcast. If you do not use Patreon but still wish to support us, please also consider checking out our PayPal page at paypal.me forward slash HPO pod. The link to both of those can also be found in the show notes. Finally, please consider subscribing to us on your favorite podcast listening platform. Now on to the next topic. This is something, one of the reasons, you know, I've heard you speak. I heard you speak on uh, the podcast, the human podcast with Jeff Wu and uh, I saw some interesting stuff. And I think it's so important that we continue to get the message out of how important it is to, you know, maintain function. And one of the primary ways we do that is by maintaining lean muscle mass. And I think that's an important thing. But uh, Keith, Dr. Keith Barr, would you let the folks know who you are just for the people that have not heard you or heard of you before, just so we can get a quick background and then we'll get yeah, into sure. some, some fun stuff. I'm not sure if you can see me so well. My camera is not perfect today, but my name is Keith Barr. I'm a professor here at the University of California, Davis. I'm cross appointed in both the central campus and the medical school campus. Um, what I study is I study musculoskeletal function and how it is affected by age, nutrition, and exercise. And so, so those are the three primary things that, that we look at in the laboratory as ways as ways that we can modulate um, how our muscle, how our musculoskeletal system functions. And that's not just the muscle, but the tendons, the ligaments, the bones within that system. So, and you're up at UC Davis, and we've had we've had a we've had a Dr. Frank Mitteloner, who's another UC Davis uh, professor up there. Uh, and I don't know if you're familiar with his work. He's he's in the agricultural sector. He works on the greenhouse gas stuff, and so a lot of good folks up at UC Davis up there. Um, you know, I think this is uh, you know I think we should just kind of talk about why why it is important for us to why do we care about the musculoskeletal system? And we're learning more and more that it is more than just you know, things to propel our skeleton around. I mean, it has a huge hormonal effect on the body. There's a lot of things that the muscles do, but what is a, what is the utility of, of, of hanging on to that stuff? Why should we care about that? Yeah. So, so the biggest, the biggest thing that I always point to is there's a, a series of studies that have been done over the last few years where basically what they show is that your muscle strength is one of the best predictors of longevity in humans. So there have been a number of different studies. One was a really good one is done by Ruiz and his colleagues. And, and basically what they showed is that if you were in the strongest third of the population at your 40th birthday, that you were half as likely to die by the age of 60. And if we only looked at deaths from cancer, that you were one quarter as likely to die from cancer. So again, strength is really important. In the biggest longitudinal study that I know of, they um, studied a, a group of Hawaiians and they followed them for 44 years. And what they found is that if you were in the strongest third of the population when they first started testing, you were two and a half times as likely to make it to 100 years of age. So, so really, the way that we talk about it is we talk about it is, is listen, that, um, the, the truism only the strong survive is a literal truism. It's something that if you are stronger, you will survive longer. And it's not only our muscles that seem to be important, because there's an, a beautiful study that came out this past year in NFL football players. And what they showed in NFL football players is if they had a serious, um, like an ACL rupture, they would, their likelihood of dying was 50% greater from cardiovascular disease. There, what we think is happening is you're getting this post-traumatic osteoarthritis. If you can't stabilize the knee properly because the ligaments aren't working properly, then what you get is you get this progressive decline so that you can't actually do the activities that you need to do to keep the rest of your body working. So you die 50% faster from heart disease because you can't actually do the physical activity, the exercise necessary to maintain cardiovascular function. So it's really not just about muscle mass and strength. It's really about the whole system, the, mu the whole musculoskeletal system. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, what you're saying is a, is a you know, a robust musculoskeletal system is, is a marker for, you know, a healthy cardiovascular system, perhaps, and, you know, just being able to do that. And you certainly see that. So what about if we were to, 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 to sort of, uh, you know, because Zach and I, Zach's an ultra endurance runner, and I'm more on the strength side. What if we were to partition out the two of us? Because Zach, 
you know, he's running hundred mile races and, and doing fine. And I'm, I'm in here, you know, doing different stuff. You know, both of us exercise, presumably both of us have reasonably decent cardiovascular systems, you know, assuming we're not engaging in other silly activities like, you know, diet, smoking, those types of things. But how does, how do we have any data on, on, on those two comparisons? Yeah. So what it looks like for us is that um, as far as the data that I've seen from a, a variety of different studies, is that what, what I always talk to people about is if we're trying to improve cardiovascular function and we're trying to improve brain function, so learning and memory, it seems that endurance-based exercises tend to be better. If we're trying to improve quality of life, functional life, as well as longevity, it seems that strength work is, is absolutely fundamentally essential. So, so again, if we have somebody who is very much an endurance-based athlete, they're going to have a smaller muscle mass. So, you know, I just met you guys, but Zach has obviously got a smaller muscle mass. <laughs> so if we're then going to start and we're going to get a disease like cancer and we're going to, all of us are going to progressively lose, or if we're going to go through our, a long life, all of us are going to progressively lose muscle mass and strength. If you're starting from a higher baseline, you will stay above that line of disability for longer than somebody who doesn't, who, who has less muscle mass and strength to begin with. So, so the way that we look at it is that as far as the endurance aspects, that's absolutely essential for cardiovascular function is wonderful for learning and memory. But the one thing it doesn't do is it doesn't seem to extend lifespan. It, it does in rodent models. There's a 7% increase in lifespan, which is a significant effect. But the effect seems to be much more on strength. If we go back to that Hawaiian study of the, of the 44 year follow up, if you're in the highest cardiovascular fitness at midlife, you're only 10% more likely to make it to 100 years of age. Whereas the strong, if you're in the strongest third, you are two and a half times. So that's 250%. So again, it, it seems like the two types of exercise are doing different things. And so for me, that means that you have to do both. Zach, you hear that? You're, you're like a week away from being frail and, and bed bound, and I'm going to outlive you, so there you go. <laughs> it sounds like I got to avoid cancer, and you got to avoid any type of cardiovascular disease. <laughs> that's right. No, so um, let's, you know, I think that's, I mean, that's really good information, and I think that's, that'll be surprising to most people, because most people, you know, I mean, we've had this mantra from the 60s, you know, jog, uh, you know, this has been the, this has been the thing that's been going on forever in the strength training stuff. And I know your background, I think you had a background as a certified strength and conditioning coach yep. at some point. So obviously you've got a little bit of perhaps bias towards that. I don't know. I mean, obviously there's data out there that supports it. I'm certainly in the, in the, in the, in the camp that we need to uh, maintain the muscle mass. Let's talk a little bit. And again, I'll point to this picture behind me because I've seen this countless times, you know, as we see these people, that get frail, they don't last long. I mean, they, they are on a, they are on a very rapid downward spiral. You know, maybe their hip gives out, maybe their kidneys fail, whatever. I mean, they're demented or something like that. And we see that very frequently. And that is all too often, uh, you know, the, the, you know, the, the harbinger of death, you know, frailty usually, usually precedes death for most animals and most people included. Let's talk a little bit about how we uh, maintain skeletal muscle mass because it's, it's so critically and strength, because I know there's a difference between muscle size and muscle strength, although many people say cross-sectional area is a pretty good proxy measure for strength. But at the same point, the research is more about strength than, than, than at least my understanding, is more about strength rather than absolute muscle size. So, so my work has started in regulating strength. So, sorry, regulating muscle mass because, the, you know, as you said, the textbooks always say that muscle mass is proportional to cross-sectional area is proportional to strength. So if we increase the muscle mass, we should increase our strength. But we have numerous now demonstrations that, that that's functionally not true, especially in special populations. So if we take old and young, we did, we did a bunch of studies in, in basically trying to mimic the, the image that you have behind you, where we take old animals and young animals and we hind limb unload them. So that means that basically it's like bed rest for their legs so that they don't, they have no loading. They can still move them freely, but there's no load on them. And what happens, what you see happen is that both in the old and young, you lose about 30% of your cross-sectional area. So the fiber size themselves decrease by about 30%. But if we then measure force in the young, the force in the young only goes down about 15%. But if we then do the same force measurement in the old, it's going down 50%. 
So what you see is that the strength changes are dramatically different old versus young. We also know that our strength declines three times faster than our muscle mass does. So if we look at strength, it's going to go down at a rate that's three times faster than a, any decline in, in muscle mass is. And so what we're, what we're realizing in a lot of our work recently is, is showing is that that ability of the strength component of it is really down to things that are well beyond the muscle mass component of it. And there's beautiful studies done by um, Stu Phillips that show that if I work my muscle to failure, no matter what weight I use, I can increase my muscle size. And we know this because I used to work out, I used to, to work out with a guy who was Mr. Canada, a bodybuilder, huge guy. He wouldn't lift huge weights, but he'd always lift a huge volume. And so the volume component seems to be really important in growing mass. But in order to get stronger, you have to lift a heavy weight. And so that Stu's also shown that by comparing the, the ones who do a low weight, so 30% of their one rep max, they go to failure in three sets. 80% of one rep max go to failure in three sets. They have the same increase in muscle mass because they're both going to failure and they're both using a big volume. But if you look at the strength, the strength improvement in the 80% group is much higher. And then he had a third group, which is 80% of one rep max for one set. And because they're lifting the heavy weight, their strength increases the same as the ones who did three sets, but because their volume was less, their muscle mass didn't increase to the same degree. So strength seems to be determined much more by load. Mass seems to be determined much more by this idea of failure. Let me just declare, we're talking about, talking about actual sarcomere size, we're talking about actomyosin, are we talking about the overall muscle with potentially fat infiltration and stuff like that? Are we talking pure you know, pure, pure motor so what we're talking, what we talking about, about is, about? is we're talking about cross-sectional area of each individual fiber. So if you can go in and what we do is we actually image, um, when we're looking at any muscle, we image the whole muscle. Um, we don't just take little sections because every muscle that you have, there's little areas where there, you have big fibers and little areas where you have smaller fibers and it's all spread out and sometimes it's grouped together. So you can, if you're only going to measure cross-sectional area in, in two or three regions, you can pick two or three different regions that look very different in your groups. And that's something that we avoid by measuring every single one of the fibers. So we're counting the area of 4,000 plus fibers in a single muscle. Um, if we're doing human muscle biopsies, they're much smaller. We're only going to have to count, you know, a few, probably about 500 to, to 750 fibers. But we're counting every single fiber and we're looking at their cross-sectional area. So how, what they're, and then we also do their, their ferrets diameter. So what's the minimum diameter? Because you don't want to get into some artifact where you've cut some of them on an angle and they're a little bit longer. So we do both minimal ferrets diameter, we do cross-sectional area. Those two things are what we're talking about by mass. This is an increase in sarcomeres in parallel. So what you've got is you've got more muscle, well, you've got more muscle myofibular protein added up in parallel, which pushes out and it makes the muscle fibers individually bigger. I want to go back to the concept of strength, because when we're talking about longevity, whether it's in humans or animal studies, what exactly, how are you, how, what are we measuring? Because I've seen grip strength, and, you know, and, and simply says not actually a great proxy. I mean, people have used that before. We've seen like, you know, leg press strength, but what, what are they using to, to determine that? Because there's a lot of ways to display strength in When we're talking well, about what specific leg press. They also did a, a, a bench press. The, the, the leg press is really the, the one that's going to be the most beneficial because, again, we're human. We're walking around on two legs. We need That's the thing that's going to give us our mobility. That's the thing that's going to give us our, our ability to do our activities of daily living. So if we have good leg strength, that's going to be a key component. We actually did a, a study um, for the USA Track and Field that we haven't that we haven't published. And what we did is we, we went to um, the USA national championships when they were here in Sacramento and we measured the strength of the throwers. We did a number of different measures. And what we found is the isometric squat strength had their best correlation with performance across all the different throwers. And so what you can find is you can find that the rate of force development is super important as well as the absolute strength. So the best measure of performance for an elite athlete was this rate of force development in an isometric squat. How quickly can you develop force? 
And that, you, that makes sense because that's power. And so if you want to compete at a high level, power is the key component for being able to throw an object for those, those individuals. But it seems to be true across a number of different sports is that your power to weight ratio is going to be one of the key things that's going to be a performance measure. And what we're looking at there is in that situation, we used isometric strength and rate of force development of an isometric contraction. But the best measures we've found for, for the longevity studies have to do with, with leg press type movements because that's giving us the, mo the important muscles that we're going to use to do our, to be able to rise and, and sit in a chair, to be able to do our activities. Yeah, I'll just make a little comment there. You know, I, I competed in the Highland Games and won Highland Game World Champs, and I trained with a lot of Olympic uh, throwers, and these guys are just incredibly explosive and strong. I mean, some of the most incredibly explosive people out there. But, you know, when we talk about leg strength, you know, obviously a large percentage of our muscle mass is in our lower extremities. And besides the functional ability of being able to be, be more independent. Are there other benefits from having muscle mass there? Are there other things that are happening systemically other than the obvious, I can walk around and I'm not, you know, dependent on a wheelchair or stuck in a chair? Absolutely. So, so one of the big things that's, that's, you know, pretty unique about humans is that our, most of our endurance is in our lower body. So most animals, because they're quadrupeds, they have to have kind of the similar endurance phenotype across their body. There's beautiful stu old studies by Bank Saltine where he went up into, uh, I think it was Greenland at the time, and he, he found the nomadic peoples there and he took muscle biopsies from their shoulders, super oxidative, he had all of this oxidative capacity that most of us don't have in our upper body because we never use our upper body for endurance purposes except in rare situations, say we're a rower or something like that, where we're actually using our upper body for endurance. So most of us don't have much endurance there. So that's really important because with endurance because comes mitochondrial mass, it comes fat oxidation enzymes, it comes all of these things that are going to be important in regulating metabolism. So our legs are going to be super important. Our leg muscle mass is going to be super important for the ability to take up glucose from the blood, to the ability to, to respond to insulin. All of those classic abilities that are, are insulin sensitizing, our, our, our metabolic our positive metabolic uh, approach, a lot of that's coming from the activity of, of the leg musculature. If I can jump in real quick, I just want to go back to kind of the strength versus uh, size or mass components. I think it's really interesting when you look at just the, just the programming of different strength routines. And I think, with, especially within the world of endurance, I think we've been moving at least closer to that being a a key component to kind of a proper training block, certainly for kind of the tip of the spear folks, you're seeing more like Olympic athletes getting into the weight room and doing some form of strength routine, as opposed to just going out and running all the time. And so from what you said, am I kind of on, am I on the right track when I'm thinking when you're in a sport that is something like maybe wrestling or mixed martial arts or running where that power weight ratio is kind of an important factor where you want to get as close to it as you can. Um, would those like single rep to failure type movements or strength workout type routines be actually more beneficial for someone in that category? So they're not adding additional mass, but adding that strength component. Yeah. So, so there's a, a number of different things in there. So I'm going to, I'm going to just kind of be convoluted and come back. So, okay. so, um, what I'll try and do is go through it. So for yourself, for example, if you're going to be a runner, the reason that we strength train is two reasons. One is to potentially improve performance at a, for a single event. But the number one reason that we strength train is to minimize injury rate. So there's a beautiful meta-analysis that shows that stretching has no effect on injury, musculoskeletal injury rate. But if you strength train with a heavy weight, it's going to decrease injuries by about two-thirds. And the reason it does this is most of the injuries that we get are because what happens is we're training in running is we're getting lots of plyometric load. We're getting lots of impact force that's on a very short time scale. And so what that does is that increases the stiffness of the musculoskeletal system within, those, within the muscles that are loaded. Now, if I take you and I have you lift a heavy weight, what happens is because as you lift a heavier and heavier weight, the movement has to go slower and slower what happens is those slow movements, the really heavy slow movements, those are optimal for decreasing the stiffness of your muscles, musculoskeletal system. Specifically for yourself, it would be in the tendons like the Achilles tendon, patellar tendon, quadricep tendon, 
what you would be looking at by doing some heavy strength training is you're going to, you're going to take a little bit of the stiffness out of those tissues so that when you're out and adding your miles in, now the miles aren't just driving your stiffness up because if your stiffness of those tendons gets, gets greater than your strength of those muscles, what you're going to get is you're going to get muscle pulls. You see it all the time in 200, 400, but you see it all the time also in the, in the endurance athletes who break down. They're going to get either, either tendon injuries, they're going to get tendinopathies, they're going to get some muscle pulls, but they're also going to get bone injuries. Many of these things are because the musculoskeletal system isn't working right. Just because having one type of loading all the time is not optimal. And what we, what, so our first thing for, inc for a strength, for a endurance, like a runner, is to do a heavy strength exercise so that that's going to increase, it's going to increase the, the, the stretchiness of the tendons, it's going to protect our muscles from injury. So that's the number one thing. The way that we would do it is we would do it immediately following your long runs, your, or, or power, or any type of performance type run. So if you're going to do a quality session, that's a good time to then put in a strength session right afterwards. You're not going to be as strong, but you don't have to lift massive weight. But the biggest, so that's going to get, do two things. It's going to decrease some of the plyometric load that you just put into the system. And the other thing that it does is the groups out of, out, of, um, out of Stockholm have shown really nicely that if you're trying to increase mitochondrial mass in your muscle, the biggest molecular target is this gene called PGC1-alpha. When you increase it, you get more of the things that are associated with endurance. Well, if you were to go for a run and then end a little bit early and do a heavy leg press, you actually get more of that gene turned on than if you were to continue running for an equivalent amount of time. So there's, and that makes sense because the, the response to, to kind of a heavy lift is increasing protein synthesis, that costs a lot of energy, you need to make energy. So you need more mitochondria. So you're getting two really important things as an endurance athlete. One is you're getting the injury prevention. The second is you're getting more of the endurance-based signal that's gonna allow your, your muscle to even better adapt. And then the last thing is you're getting the strength effect. And as you get closer and closer to your event, what you would do is you would use fewer of the really heavy lifts. And now you go into some lighter lifts where you can move them more quickly where you can increase the stiffness in the system a little bit. And now what you've got is you've got an improvement in performance. So what we would do is in the base phase of training, you would do lots of heavy lifting because what we're trying to do in the base phase is we're trying to give you lots of volume as far as you're running, and that's going to potentially increase the risk of injury. So we're gonna do some heavy lifting. As we go into specific prep, we're gonna decrease our heavy lifts. We're gonna start introducing more plyometric moves in the gym which is going to increase the stiffness progressively, and that's going to improve performance as a runner. If you're talking about, now, the other thing you asked about was weight class-based athletes, where they're really focused on strength, they don't necessarily want to add mass, absolutely right that what you would want to do in that situation, you do one set heavy, or you do a few sets heavy, where what you're doing, or sorry, you're doing less weight, where you're trying to move the weight quickly, and you're only going to do a few repetitions. You're not going to go to failure. So you want to go at a relatively high weight so that you can get the strength effect, but you don't want to go until you're, you're going to failure because as you go to failure, you're progressively moving the weight more slowly through the range. So if, if we're going to do this, what we're going to do is we're going to do, say, three repetitions at a heavy weight, but by the end of three repetitions, your velocity is coming down, and so we don't want to go on further because we want you to move that quickly. So if I was going to have an MMA fighter or somebody else who was, or a weight class rower, for example, we would do lots of heavy work, fewer sets, not going to failure. So the volume is lower. The load is really high. They get the strength effects with less of a stimulus for growing mass. Yeah, kind of, kind of reminiscent of, you know, how a lot of the Olympic lifters train, you know, cause they're obviously they're, 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 you know, like you can look at the Bulgarians from the eighties where they dominate and they were doing lots of low, you know, they were doing a lot of, a lot of low rep sets. I mean, that's, a, that's classically how lip lifters training. But let me go back to, I want to talk more about this longevity thing just, and then go on to another topic, but we know women in general live longer than men. I mean, that's, there's no doubt about that. That's, you know, that's one of the factors you can't modify, you know, women are going to outlive us. But when, we, when I look at the physique of a woman, most of their muscle mass is in their legs. They have a higher percentage of leg muscle mass to upper body muscle mass. Is there any 
thought that that may be one of the reasons that 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 they outlive us perhaps um it's not something that i've seen presented so a lot of the the interesting things with women and and the and the beneficial effects uh, of being a woman as far as longevity some of it's the some of it's that you know they they're able to maintain their mass better than than men they have there are other advantages to estrogen and so at menopause some a number of different diseases that are very dis disparate between men and women. Suddenly the women come back up to the male level. So there are direct contributors such as, um, such as estrogen that, that do have a protective effect. But I don't know of any studies that have looked specifically at leg strength and made that something that's correlated to, to um, longevity. Let me talk about women in general then about longevity. We talk about the effect of maintaining strength. Does that equally apply to both men and women with the studies that we have data on? So uh, the studies that I'm familiar with, it, it is in both men and women. So some of the mass, so some of the better ones for the men and women, they look at muscle mass and they take a muscle mass reading and then they do longevity. Um, the Ruiz study was, I think, only in men. And I think the Hawaiian study was, was in both men and women, but I I, I'm not positive about that. So there is data on both men and women that says that the, the strength component is important for longevity. All right, let me delve into another topic here because this has had a lot of press and a lot of controversy over the last you know, few years particularly. There's a compound called mTOR, which I know you're very familiar with. And there's a lot of people out there, guys, Ron Rosedale, uh, Walter Longo and others, based on really kind of lower level organisms, you know, fruit flies, nematodes, single cell organisms, mice studies are saying that we really, really need to limit our exposure or mTOR stimulation. And we know that mTOR is essential for muscle protein synthesis. And so how do we, how do you, how do you sort of navigate that? Because I think it's more nuanced than just less limit, less limit mTOR at all costs. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so that's a great question because, you know, the work on mTOR is, is, was basically started um, uh, when a group out of Michigan found that when they, when they gave mice uh, an mTOR inhibitor called rapamycin, the mice lived longer. And it was about 16%. So it wasn't a small effect. It was a really uh, substantial effect. So, so that's one thing that's really important. And, and mTOR, what it does is it regulates growth. Um, and it does a couple of other things that are really, really important. Um, the important component of the growth regulation is that, um, especially in lower organisms like rodents, like mice, mice, 80% um, of mice die from cancer. And so if you're inhibiting a, a protein that is regulating cancer growth, so growth of these cells and cancerous growth, you're going to have a dramatic effect on longevity because you're inhibiting these, the development of these cancers and the mice are going to live long. So that's one component of it that's, that's potentially just isolated to, to a model organism. But we also know that if you look at, you know, if you look at dogs, for example, a bigger dog is going to live a shorter lifespan than a smaller dog. A lot of the difference between the big dog and the small dog is down to IGF-1 signaling during development. And IGF-1 signals through mTOR. And so if the idea is that if you have more mTOR signaling, you're going to be a bigger individual, that's your great thing, but it's going to shorten your lifespan. Whereas a smaller organism, like you know, a, a smaller poodle, is going to have a longer lifespan because it didn't have as much signaling that activated mTOR. So, so there's there is sound you know arguments as to why you'd want to do it. The only thing that, as you mentioned, becomes problematic is that if we were to give somebody who is who is older or potentially starting to be sarcopenic, if we were to give them rapamycin what happens is that it accelerates the rate of sarcopenia because muscle mTOR is important not only for building muscle, it's important for muscle protein synthesis. It's also essential to the ability of muscle to recovery after injury. So if you go out and you do a, if you go out and you do a session and, and you produce some sort of damage in the muscle, in order for that damage, that damaged muscle to be fixed, you need to activate mTOR because mTOR, it's a, you know, it's essential to the immune system. So rapamycin as a drug is famous because it is an immunosuppressant. It blocks the immune system. So if you are going to potentially have 
you know, a muscle damage, a muscle injury, and you have to repair it, you need the inflammatory system to do that. Any type of injury repair needs mTOR in order to do it. But a lot of what we're learning is that, and also for our ability to, and what we've learned in the last few years is that if we want to try and fight some cancer, what we're going to do is we're going to have to bring in the immune system to try and fight the cancer. All of these things are pointing to, there are times when you don't want mTOR to be on, and there are times when you definitely need mTOR to be on. So if I want to regulate my muscle mass and I want to keep my muscle mass, I need to be able to activate mTOR by my feeding and by my exercise. If I can't do that, my muscle is going to shrink away faster than if I, than if I can do that. And so what we're, what we're um, trying to come up with it are ways that aren't based on a pharmaceutical product as a way to, to block kind of global mTOR activity. Because what we want is we want mTOR to be low in tissues like the liver. And we want mTOR to be low in other tissues where you potentially are going to develop cancers. We want mTOR to start low in muscle, and then we want it to be able to be turned on to a very high level after you eat or after you do exercise or after you suffer a muscle injury. We want, if we get an infection, we want our immune system to go from a very low level of activity, a low level of mTOR, to very high so they can fight that, that, that pathogen that's in your body. So there are definitely times when it would work and that you want mTOR to be low. And if we're looking at a model organism, it lives in a pathogen-free environment and it dies eight out of 10 die from cancer, in that environment, it's ideal to not have mTOR activity. The food is right above it, the water is right there, they don't have to do activities of daily living. And so there's nothing that's going to say you want mTOR in that situation. If you want to live long and you're, and you're a, a mouse living in a, in, a, in a small box, no mTOR is great. If you're a human and now you have to do activities of daily living, you have to be strong enough to do things. You have to be able to repair your muscle. You have to be able to respond to immuno, immunopathogens. Now you need to, at some points, you need to really be able to turn on mTOR. I'm just, just with the, the mice, you know, say, saying that 80% of them die of cancer, which is pretty fascinating to me. I didn't realize that. I would assume those are lab animals and not wild animals, you know, that are, that are typically yeah. running around. Probably half of those guys get eaten anyway. So, I mean. A lot more than that. Yeah. So, I mean, that's very interesting. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, because a lot of people, again, back to this mTOR stuff, a lot of people are saying that, we, you know, we really need to uh, minimize the amount of protein we eat. You know, even the, the, the RDA right now is 0.8 per kilogram. Some people are saying even that's too high. And, you know, maybe we should even, you know, be getting like, you know, a, a guy like me, maybe 60, 70 grams per day. And, you know, I'm 250 pounds. I don't feel that would be particularly tenable, but what are your thoughts on dietary protein, how it stimulates mTOR, what other things impact mTOR activation, and how should we approach that, you know, in a global sense? And I know we can talk about with and without exercise, because I think those are, those are important uh, right. variables. So, so mTOR is activated by three things that we know of really, really, that there's really, really good evidence for. One, we've already talked about the, the idea of resistance exercise. It gets turned on by that. Um, the other things that it gets exercise or activated by are amino acids, and it's specifically the amino acid leucine, a little bit by arginine. Both of those will activate it, but it won't completely activate it. So there's two ways that it happens. So the amino acid component is one part of it, but by itself, it doesn't really activate mTOR completely. The other thing that you need is you need either the exercise stimulus or you need a stimulus from insulin. And this is where what you're doing is now you're having a trade-off. So if I was going to be looking at different dietary interventions, there's two dietary interventions that would decrease global mTOR. One is by limiting protein intake and severely limiting protein intake um, so that you're not activating mTOR throughout. And we know that um, protein deficient diets actually do lead to an increase in longevity. The other way to do it is by limiting carbohydrate intake so that you're limiting the insulin the insulin up, uh, you know, excursions through the day so that you're not getting big rises in insulin. And we know from the study that, that we did here with John Ramsey um, that if you do a ketogenic diet, and a ketogenic diet in a rodent is both low protein, about 10% protein, 90% fat, no carbohydrate, the animals lived about 13% longer. And again, what was interesting there is the animals that did die in the ketogenic diet group, they didn't die from cancer. So eight out of, so we, we 
we did 10 animals per group. We, we did necropsies in the, in the controls. Eight of the 10 died from cancer. In the ones that had, had the ketogenic diet for 12, for, since they were 12 months old, that only two out of the 10 animals died from cancer. So again, that's telling us that one of the big effects on longevity in that, in that study was to decrease overall um, cancer, uh, cancer growth. And it, again, consistent with that, what we saw is that mTOR in tissues like the liver and, and the heart and other things tended to be lower, All right? And so, so this is, if we want to decrease mTOR, there, there are those two different ways of doing it because both, you need both insulin and amino acids. So if you cut out the carbohydrate to some degree and that decreases insulin fluctuations, then what you're going to do is you're going to get less of an mTOR activation. Or if you decrease the protein, you're going to get less at mTOR activation. And so as a result of that, there's two different ways of doing it. And again, both of them seem to have an increase in longevity. Um, given that both of them have an increase in longevity in the, in the sort of the higher fat or ketogenic diet with, I assume, adequate protein versus a low protein group, what did the low protein group animals die of, you know, typically? So that wasn't the study that, that we did. So I can't, I can't recall off the top of my head what they were dying from. Um, but again, I don't think that the, I think again, that what they were seeing is that there was fewer incidents of cancer and it, it's just a common, it's a common finding there. And, you know, there was an idea that it was because there's these, um, there's this hormone that can be released. It's, a, it's supposed to be a hormone that's released upon feeding and is specifically going to be responsive to protein. It's a hormone called FGF21. And a lot of people thought that that was going to be important in the longevity effect of these low protein diets. But it, it doesn't seem like that. Well, in an, in an animal that doesn't have FGF21, you still see the longevity effect. So, so it's not a signaling effect outside, but what we think is happening is you're decreasing kind of global mTOR activity and it's having a similar effect to rapamycin. But the advantage of the diets, the advantage of a ketogenic diet, when I look at and I'm trying to say, okay, how are we going to do this and apply this into a human, is if you're in a situation where you have low mTOR activity at baseline, and then you do resistance exercise, there's, you're now gonna activate mTOR, which you can't do if you've got the drug rapamycin. If you have, and together with the, with the protein in your diet, that's going to give you a bigger effect than if you didn't have the protein and you only had the resistance exercise. So, so what you're doing in that situation is you're getting both of the stimuli. One is the amino acids and one is either the insulin or the resistance exercise. When you've got from a low protein diet, now you go and try and activate your mTOR with your resistance exercise, it should impair the activation because there's not enough leucine to get the second part of the mTOR activation. So your muscle isn't gonna have as big of a response. You're not gonna be able to activate um, your immune system as well. You're not gonna be able to regenerate your muscle quite as well in a low protein situation. Now for a word from our sponsors. What are you doing with that X3 bar? What's your experience been so far? Yeah, it's, uh, it's been great so far. I've been using it quite a bit at home. It's saved me a couple trips to the gym. I've been mostly doing deadlifts with it, and I've actually brought it on a couple trips with me too because it's pretty easy to throw in, uh, into a rolling duffel and kind of bring with you on the road. Yeah, I mean, I found particularly the deadlift, um, you know, I've been a pretty decent deadlifter, and, you know, I've pulled over 700 pounds, and I know when I use this big orange band that uh, – it's pretty tough. It, it actually, for a band workout, it definitely simulates the heavy lifting. I think you're right. It's uh, very nicely suited for travel, for sure. It's a good, uh, certainly accessory exercise for many people. And I think a lot of people can use it as their primary uh, training tool, depending upon what their goals are. But I think the key I found is you've got to use it as designed. And that includes uh, really pushing to failure. And when you get there, you really know it. It definitely gets your heart rate up, even though even things like biceps curls, I find my heart rate jacked up after doing that. So I think I've been pretty impressed with the product overall uh, in certain situations for sure. Awesome. And uh, Dr. Jakish has a uh, poster that comes with it that gives you a kind of a breakdown of kind of the moves and different lifts that he addresses with it too. Head over to x3bar.com for products, videos, and training programs. Now back to the show. 
So, I mean, I know there are people out there talking about it, you know, because I know a lot of this stuff is still done in, in lab animals, particularly rats. And so there's, there's some problems extrapolating that to humans. Uh, there are people that are talking about using rapamycin for humans. And, and you would have caution with that because of the global effect. It's not, it doesn't have a differential effect on what it shuts down. And so we'd be, we'd be in danger of inhibiting muscle protein synthesis therefore leading to potentially increasing the chance of getting sarcopenia. Is that, is that my understanding? Yeah, so there is, there is at least um, one study I'm familiar with where they gave the low-dose rapamycin that's important for um, the longevity effects, and they did see an acceleration of sarcopenia. So that, is, that would be a concern of mine. Um, the rapamycin has worked well in companion animals like dogs, seems to reverse a lot of the age-associated issues. But in humans, again, it, it does look like there is, there is a, a problem in that you're accelerating the rate of, of muscle loss. How do we, because you talked about avoiding uh, mTOR activation in the liver and, you know, what are the, whatever tissues we're concerned about as, as a concern for things like cancer. How do we, I mean, you know, I, I know that you just talked about insulin, you know, but insulin affects all tissues. I mean, how do we keep it, from, keep it out of the muscle when we, you know, when you're keeping it, uh, you know, out of the liver and in, in, into the muscle or vice versa. How does, how does that seem to work? So, so one of the interesting things here is that um, there's really nice work uh, that was done by, by Scott Kimball's group out of Penn State, where what they did is they had, um, they had again, it's an animal study, but they had animals run um, and, and get a, a good aerobic workout in. And then they looked at mTOR activation in the liver. And what they saw is when the animals were in a physiological stress, they went for a run, they went and they ran pretty hard. What they saw is that they blocked the activation of mTOR in the liver. Um, we've, we've shown it in the muscle when we do endurance exercise and we look at um, mTOR activity. So if we run rats on a treadmill for a long period of time or for any period of time, what we're gonna see is after the, after the run, mTOR activity is gonna go down. Um, and that's just something that we've seen across and a number of other people have seen. Um, the interesting thing is that the protein synthesis after the exercise goes up, even though our activity of mTOR goes down. So you can activate protein synthesis in the absence of mTOR. Um, we even added rapamycin. We still had no effect on that. So, so there's really nice data that show in, in running, what we're going to do is we can have muscle-specific inactivation. We can have liver-specific inactivation of mTOR. We can have adipose tissue-specific inactivation of mTOR. At the same time, we have activation of mTOR within the brain, and that's associated with learning and memory. So some of, some of the positive effects of exercise are actually because they're having this global ability to regulate mTOR in a variety of different tissues. And what I do in my skeletal muscle, when I exercise my skeletal muscle, I'm going to do something to my mTOR, which might be exactly opposite to what I'm doing in my liver and my adipose tissue might be the same as what we're doing in the brain. So really understanding how something like riding a bike really hard, I'm gonna get a quad muscle activation, I'm gonna get calf muscle activation, then I'm gonna get you know, inhibition of mTOR in my liver, I'm gonna get it inhibited in a lot of other areas. And it could be that some of the, some of the really beneficial effects of, of the exercise are because it's having these tissue specific effects on things like mTOR or we're driving down the activity in, in these other tissues, and we're potentially preventing some of the things that we would see with, with just without exercise in a, in a dietary excess. And that goes so, across the board for types of exercise too. So like if Sean did like an explosive workout, would he also see that reduction in mTOR in his, in his liver, and, but an increase in the muscles in the brain? So, yeah, we've got a, a paper we've never been able to publish. And basically what we did is we, we did resistance exercise with 2% of the body mass of, of a rat. So we exercised their, their, their calf and their shin muscles. And then what we did is we looked at insulin sensitivity on the other leg at 30 minutes, three hours, six hours. What we see is we see a global effect. Is in the first little bit after exercise, it seems like there's, if you inject insulin, you get insulin resistance. And that's throughout the whole body. But then what happens is 24 hours later, you get a hyperactivation. So if we inject the same amount of insulin, we get a bigger response. We increase insulin sensitivity. And it's really cool because what it says is that depending on when you are 
doing something. So if you do something at eight o'clock in the morning and you go then and eat a meal, your body is relatively insulin resistant except for the muscle that you've exercised because it doesn't need the insulin in order to get glucose uptake and storage of protein and all of those other things. But all the other tissues, they seem to not respond to the insulin as well immediately. And then what'll happen is over time, their response is gonna go up. And so what we think is happening there is that we're, we're secreting factors from the working muscle that are affecting global insulin sensitivity. But it could also be that by doing that heavy lift that you talk about, now we're gonna get immediately after, we don't need any insulin to get an increase in glucose uptake and blood flow and, and fatty acid uptake into the working muscle. But the rest of our muscle, the rest of our body would need that. So in that situation, all the nutrients are targeted to the muscles that we worked. But in the liver, after a heavy lift, you're going to have a period where insulin sensitivity is down. And then over time, it's going to come back up and it's going to go actually higher than it was before. And so that's a really nice, that's a really nice way of saying that if you do strength exercise, you're going to modulate mTOR specifically in the tissues that you exercise. In the other tissues, you're going to have potentially a reverse effect where in, in mo many of those tissues, mTOR is going to be shut down. And then transiently over time, your sensitivity to signals like feeding, like, like exercise, like insulin, those are going to go up so that your delta, the difference between where you are at rest and where you are after a meal is bigger. And so now what you get is you get more of the beneficial effects and fewer of the kind of slow rise effects where we get a transient period where you have a long elevation that seems to be bad physiologically. It seems our body is actually pretty darn smart, you know, <laughs> when we look at that. Um, I want to, I want to ask you about, uh, you know, just like, a, you know, so if we, if I were to translate this into, you know, for actual, uh, you know, information for people to, to use, you know, it would seem like you can go on a low protein diet if you want to, but you, you do that at risk of potentially sarcopenic problems later on in life, particularly you can eat an adequate amount of protein. And we can discuss what adequate is in perhaps a lower carbohydrate state. We include uh, some sort of training, you know, probably I'm, I'm guessing a, a combination of resistance training and then probably some cardiovascular specific training as well being probably a pretty good solution there. And then I, and then I just want to confirm that, that that's, you know, kind of what you're saying. And then I want to ask you about this, again, this longevity thing about being stronger. Is there a point of diminishing returns? That is to say, does, you know, uh, half Thor Bjornsson, the world's strongest man, is he going to live to 500? You know, what is the point where we say, okay, I'm strong enough? Right. So, so it's a, it's a really good question because really what we're, what we look at is we all, we know that the bigger organ, the bigger you are within a specific species, the lower your lifespan is in general. So we talked about the dogs in, we talked about the dogs initially that said, okay, if you're going to be a great Dane, your lifespan is going to be shorter than if you're going to be a little poo. And, and that's just because again, of this size component. So part of that goes into what we talked about earlier with the male female differential because of sexual dimorphism, the men are bigger, that, plays a role in, in this shorter lifespan. What we're talking about when we're talking about the strongest third of the population, we're not talking about necessarily world's strongest man. We're not talking about the mountain. We're not talking about these individuals who are huge because they also have the secondary component of having grown big and strong very early on. And that seems to, for whatever reason, decrease longevity. So what we're looking at is we're looking at people who are you know, relatively average in size. If you're stronger and you're average in size, you're going to live longer. If you are stronger and you're bigger, that's going to help you live longer than if you are bigger and weaker. So it's relative to your body mass to, to, a, to a, a degree. And, and so that's important. Um, as far as, you know, what you had asked there briefly was about how much protein would you be looking at taking in? So what we know is that as we get older, we are less, um, we're less uh, able to take up, absorb, and use the protein from our diet. Uh, specifically, you know, as our ability to digest and absorb goes down, we're going to get fewer of the amino acids of the food that we ate into our body. Beautiful work from Luke Van Loon showed that, you know, if we take a steak and we take a hamburger, 
you're gonna make more muscle protein from the hamburger than you would from the steak. Basically, it's already broken down, it's easier to digest and absorb. And so the result is that you get a better muscle protein synthetic response. And so if your teeth are not as good and you don't chew as much and all of these things happen as we get older, we're not absorbing, we're not getting as much of the protein there. So what um, Stu Phillips has is, is really led the field here about talking about how much protein people need as they increase um, in, in age. And what it seems like is if when we're young, it seems like we need about 0.25 grams per kilogram body weight in each meal. If we're going to do a whole body lift and we're going to lift every muscle in our body, now we're going to need to increase that. Because as we said when I was talking about when we, when we exercise the small muscle mass, a lot of the nutrients are targeted to the exercise muscle. So if I exercise my whole body and I have to spread those nutrients over a bigger area, now I'm going to need more protein. So instead, if I do just my legs, what I would do is I would um, just need the 0.25 grams per kilogram body weight. If I do my whole body, now I'm going to increase that to about 0.4 grams per kilogram body weight. And that's when I'm young. As we get older, what it seems like is that each meal we need to get much more um, we're going to need to be much more, uh, we're going to need to get a greater protein uh, concentration in each meal. So we need to shift up towards 0.4 grams per kilogram body weight in order to get the same protein synthetic rate that a young person got at 0.25 grams per kilogram body weight. There's a beautiful study on this by Dan Moore where he shows the curves, he, he feeds people, in, he looks at data where people are fed increasing amounts and the, kit, the curves are just shifted. Old people maximal at 0.4, young people maximal at 0.25. Yeah, you know, you know, again, I assume this, this is all mostly down to uh, probably absorption characteristics because we know the old person's GI system just, just loses efficiency. And I think, honestly, I think that's a, that's a, that's a byproduct of disease and not necessarily age in, in my, my view. But um, so we see that, and, and it's important to say that's per meal because when we add those things up, and that's assuming you're eating, I guess, three meals a day, perhaps. I don't know. Three to four um, meals per day. So yeah, you'd be so, 1.2 to 1.6 if you're older. Yeah, so we're, we're getting close to that, you know, almost, you know, a, a gram per pound of body weight for some people and if you're particularly uh, active. So that's much more than, than, than a lot of advocates out there that will, will, will support. Again, and this goes to yeah, this. So if you look at, so again, Stu Phillips has done the majority of the work on, on this, and he's, he's really been um, quite vocal about the fact that, that we're giving older individuals, uh, we're contributing to their sarcopenia by saying that you shouldn't consume it because people are worried about kidney problems, but there's no evidence, there's no solid scientific evidence that kidney function is, is impaired by high protein diets. People are worried about bone mass. There's no evidence that bone mass is, is impaired by a high protein diet. Bone is actually extremely responsive to protein in the meal. So if you take a protein meal, um, Dan Cuthbertson, uh, and when he was with Mike Rennie, had shown that the increase in protein synthetic rate within the bone is the same as within the muscle. So you get a really big increase in protein synthesis within the bone. So there's not really a worry there that you're going to get bone or kidney problems. What we tend to do is we tend to, because protein is the most expensive nutrient, and as we get older and we're potentially on a limited, uh, unlimited budget, a lot of elderly people are choosing meals that are lower in protein because it's going to be cost effective. But again, that's contributing to their, their progressive decline. If what is there, if anything, with uh, the mTOR response to eating protein, is there any efficacy in doing larger, less frequent meals then? So you're not kind of pinging that system as frequently, or is that just kind of a wash over time within the, if you're hitting the same amount of kind of grams per day, so to speak? So, so there's a, a beautiful study by Jose Areta where what he did was he fed either 20 grams of protein. So that's about 0.25 grams per kilogram body weight. He fed that every three hours or he did 10 every hour and a half, or he did 40 every six. And what he found is that the acute protein synthetic response in muscle was greatest when you did 20 grams every three hours. Because what happens is the leucine level goes up, peaks around 30 minutes, it comes down, and is back down to baseline about 90 minutes. And you need to be able to go up and down because the problem that we have, and this is, I, I always tell my students that 
think of a teenage boy, like an 18 year old boy who eats every, every time he sees food. So he's eating really frequently and the baseline leucine doesn't come down. And what happens is the baseline doesn't come down and there's ways in which mTOR feeds back on the system and it can shut the system off and lead to insensitivity to the nutrient. So if you have a constant level of amino acids in the blood, what's gonna happen is mTOR is gonna to work to feed back to shut down the ability to turn on mTOR. And so what you're gonna do is you're gonna get a progressive decline in mTOR activity as a result of the feeding. So the baseline is gonna go up slightly, but the res response to feeding is gonna come down. So what you really need is you need periods where it goes up and it periods where it's down and it's down low. And that seems to be, every three to four hours seem to be optimal in order to maximize the response within a muscle as to the ability to respond to that, to that protein meal. Because the 10 grams every hour and a half, the protein synthetic response was about 20 plus percent lower than the 20 grams every three hours. And again, the bolus was even low, a little tiny bit lower. So they had 40 grams every six hour, that was even a little bit lower than the 10 grams every hour, every hour and a half. So you really seem to be able to need to get this 0.25, needs to come back out. So the leucine goes up in the blood, peaks about 30 minutes, comes back down by about 90 minutes, stays down for a little while longer, and then comes up again for your next meal. And if you have those periods of peak leucine, trough leucine, then mTOR activity can go up and down really dynamically, and it's gonna be the most beneficial way that we seem to be able to, to feed in order to, to optimize muscle protein. Let me ask you about protein quality because there's, you know, there's a couple, uh, you know, there's something called PDCAS, which I'm sure you're familiar with. And, and then there's something now, the DIAS, which is kind of the newer iteration, you know, to, I think it's called the digestible indispensable amino acid score, where they're looking at, you know, kind of ileal, you know, protein quality, I guess. Um, you know, there's different proteins that are, that are considered higher. I know traditionally we see things like whey protein being probably one of the better sources followed by, you know, eggs, meat, milk, or, you know, eggs and meat and stuff like that. And then some of the soy and then the rest of the plant-based products. And so now there are, I just saw David Katz and, and uh, Chris Gardner coming up with a new sort of protein scoring system. Uh, and they're including environmental concerns and potential concerns about, you know, problems with different types of you know, meat sources like red meat and colorectal cancer. And they're, they're, they're really radically changing the scoring, whereas now rice, you know, brown rice and uh, pistachios are considered a better source of protein than things like red meat and, and, and things like that. So what are, your, what, are you, what are your thoughts on dietary protein quality? How does that fall in, in your mind? So as I, as I mentioned earlier, for me as a muscle physiologist, um, it, it really comes down to two things that have to be in the protein. The one is the leucine content. And the rest is just all of the, you need to have the other building blocks. Because what, what it is, is that leucine is the trigger that's turning on mTOR that's going to activate the system in order to start protein synthesis. But in order to do protein, perform protein synthesis, you have to have a source of all of the other amino acids. So you need the essentials plus leucine, and it's really the leucine content that's important. Really, as far as a, from a muscle point of view, what we're looking for is we're looking to, to increase leucine and we're looking to have that transient rise in leucine within the blood. If we have the reason that soy is not as good at, as a muscle building protein as, as um, whey protein is that it doesn't increase leucine in the blood as well as, as, well as uh, whey protein does. There's some nice studies um, by Blake Rasmussen where he adds leucine into whey protein Gets the, or sorry, into, um, into soy protein, and he gets the exact same response in the muscle to, that he got from whey protein. So it's really about the leucine content of the protein. And most of the plant-based proteins tend to be relatively low in, in leucine, and that's why you either need to eat more of a plant-based protein to get the same leucine trigger, or you need to have some other methodology of, of trying to get that leucine component within there. And so for me, I, you know, now, as far as the protein chemistry or as far as the food chemistry of it, I don't know about the definitions. As far as being a muscle biologist, I want, it, I want there to be leucine content in there that is readily available, um, that 
that we can extract and absorb because I need leucine to go up in the blood in order for my muscle to actually respond in the way I want it to in order to get the maximal effect of that, of that protein feeding that I just had. What about, uh, what about leucine supplementation or branched chain amino acid supplementation versus getting the same uh, from food? Is there any data that would show one or the other is superior? So, so yeah, there's, there's a, a number of different studies that show that um, it's better to get it from, a, from something like a whey protein that has all of the other amino acids in it. So there's a number of studies here that, that talk about the importance of leucine. One was out of, out of Stockholm again, where they, they had a, a protein source that had, but they removed the leucine and they didn't get an increase in, in muscle protein synthesis. Um, we did some work with Stu Phillips where we added synthetic leucine and we didn't see that it had a huge effect on protein synthesis unless you had all the other amino acids present. So we can turn on the molecular signaling within the muscle, but if there's no, if there's no, sub, if there's no um, building blocks to make new protein from, because you don't have the other amino acids, you can't, you can't synthesize protein to the same degree. So the leucine supplementation, the issue that happens with it is because it's a pharmaceutical grade leucine, it goes into the blood really quickly. Within 15 minutes, it's at its peak and it's gone by about 30-ish minutes. So the signal isn't long enough to get the maximal effect. But what um, Luke Van Loon and Rennie Koopman had shown is that if you take a whole protein and you add more leucine to it, you get a slightly bigger effect. And it's a slightly bigger effect. It's a marginal effect. It's less, it's around, it's around two to 5% of an increase in protein balance. So, I mean, just to clarify, so if I were to eat, say, a relatively leucine deficient source of protein, say, you know, say a soy protein or something like that, and then add leucine in in a supplement, the effect would still be fairly minimal relative if, if, if I were to take a whole complete source of protein food that actually had the leucine content in at the beginning. So if you were to do the soy with a little bit of leucine, you would have a good response to it? It wouldn't necessarily be as good as a whey protein, but it would be pretty comparable. Um, if you were to do, what's, a, what's another, another good? So if you were to do branched chain amino acids, for example, and you were just to take a branched chain amino acid, we showed with Kevin Tipton that if you were to compare that to what you would get from, from whey protein, the branched chain amino acids turn things on and get things going, but it doesn't increase protein synthesis nearly as much as a whey protein would. Because it's, it's limited in the fact that, yeah, we're, we're starting the energy, we're starting the machinery, but we don't have any of, the, of what we need in order to make the product that we want to make. We don't have any of the other amino acids in order to build protein. And so we become limited because there's fewer of these substrates. So if we take a whey protein that is a complete protein, and it's rich in leucine, we have both the signal to turn on protein synthesis and all of the amino acids in order to build the new protein. If we take a branched chain amino acid, we're turning on the protein synthetic response, but there's nothing to build with. So the only thing, the only way that we can build new protein is if we get the essential amino acids. And the only source of those is stored protein within the, within the muscle proteins themselves. So what we do is we break down protein in order to synthesize new protein. And that's why when we do resistance exercise and we're fasted, both synthesis and degradation go up because if you're fasted, you don't have essential amino acids. The resistance exercise has turned on the signal to make new protein. You don't have any of the substrate, any of the essential amino acids. So now you have to get them, and the only source of them is other muscle proteins. So you break down muscle protein, produce essential amino acids, and then you build up the new proteins. So you're stealing from your biceps to build your quads in that situation. So hey, let me ask you a little bit about... Uh, frequency of training uh, because there are people that are proponents of relatively low frequency training. This would be like the uh, hit folks, high intensity training where, where, you know, maybe once a week, what does the research sort of support with regard to that, with regard to both strength and then perhaps hypertrophy as far as is, do we have an ideal frequency that we need to look at or target? Again, frequency is going to be determined by the other things within the, within the equation. So that's, that's intensity and that's duration. So if you go at a really, really high intensity, 
And as a result, you would then decrease your duration of your training bout. But because you're going at a high intensity, it's going to take you longer to recover. So your frequency of training bouts within the week is going to be lower. If I train at a lower intensity, now I can train more frequently. Okay, so, so all three of those things, your, your training intensity, your training volume and your training frequency. So you're training the length of time you're training, so the duration, the, the intensity, and the frequency are all directly interrelated. So if I, if I increase the intensity, I either have to, to maintain the same, I either have to decrease the duration or decrease the number of bouts per week. So if I'm doing high intensity work, I don't have to do as many lifting sessions per week. I can do two lifting sessions per week, one to two at a high intensity, but if I'm gonna decrease the intensity and potentially do more volume, so I'm gonna try and get to failure and I'm gonna try and use a lighter weight and I'm gonna try and increase the length of time that I'm gonna spend there by doing multiple sets. Now, because I haven't gone at a higher intensity, my recovery is gonna be quicker, and so the result is I can train, a, a, again, more, free, more, uh, more quickly. Do you see any uh, benefit from a recovery standpoint to dietary uh, uh, dietary practices? So there's definitely things like if I need to train again tomorrow, I'm going to need to replenish my glycogen quickly so that I can work at a high level and I can train again. If I, if I want to train more frequently, the biggest thing that we know is it's going to be the protein content. Because protein content is, yeah, it's important in the, in the muscle protein synthesis in response to the exercise. But I also mentioned earlier that mTOR is essential to be able to regenerate muscle. So if I've done any damage from my training session, be it a running session, be it a lifting session, being any type of session, in order to fix that damage, I need mTOR activation. Again, the leucine-rich protein is going to help that. So those two components are going to be, are going to be really good for for if I need to train again frequently. And then the number one thing to do to, to increase recovery is to sleep. And most people, they, they'll try and master every single thing but the sleep component. You know, all of the bodybuilders I used to work with, they would be so concerned about their, their feeding component that they would wake themselves up once or twice in the night so that they would be able to take in protein. But they forgot the fact that they were, it would take them a long time to get back to sleep and their sleep quality went down and their performance went down. So I would give up some of the feeding component in order to promote the sleep component because that's really essential in order to, in order to recover, regenerate, and, and be able to perform again. I don't know if you, if you do much with, with uh, regard to the inflammatory component of training because, you know, there is an inflammatory response, particularly when you train at high-level intensity. Um, and, and many people, you know, they talk about how to, what to, what to do with that. Is it good? Is it bad? Do we need to be sitting in ice baths? W what are your thoughts on, on how do we deal with inflammation or just in general with regard to strength or, or muscle building? Okay. So, so basically, uh, it depends on where we are in our, in our season. So if I'm at a period where I've got lots of games and I got to recover, if I'm in the, the Tour de France and I have to perform again tomorrow, I'm sitting in an ice bath, I'm taking NSAIDs, I'm doing all of the stuff that's going to limit inflammation. But if I'm training, I'm in my base phase or I don't have a competition coming up, I'm not going to touch it because all of that process is going to be important in the adaptive response. If I limit the adaptive response, I'm going to limit my what I'm trying to improve. And so what we what we tend to think of is we, we tend to look at recovery as there's two things that improve both the rate at which we recover and increase or, or maintain the adaptive response, and that's protein and sleep. Everything else, compression, um, ice baths, um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, carbohydrate replenishment, all of those things have the potential to accelerate recovery but decrease adaptation. And so what we would do is if we're in a performance period of the season where we need to perform again tomorrow or the next day or the next day, now what we're going to do is we're going to impair or we're going to limit inflammation as much as we can. We're going to use all of our modalities to limit inflammation. If we're in training and we're in a base phase, we're not going to compete soon. We're going to, we're going to do things to accentuate the metabolic stress. We're going to do things to maintain 
this kind of low level or high responsiveness inflammation that we're getting because it's potentially important in the, in the adaptation that we're looking for. Let me ask you just, uh, just as a prescription based on what you know for, you know, maintaining function, maintaining longevity, if you can give us a kind of general prescription. And then if there's anything else you think we need to be aware of that, that might, might, you know, be surprising to people. Yeah. So, so what we do is for maintaining function, longevity, what we're looking to do is we're looking, so we know for cardiovascular function, what I need to do is I need to, the stimulus for the heart to adapt is when it stretches. So when I start exercising, I increase blood flow back to the heart. It's going to cause the heart to stretch. It's going to pump more blood. That stretch on the heart, so the increase in stroke volume, peaks at 40% of VO2 max. So I only have to go 40% of VO2 max in order to maximize stretch on the heart, maximize the adaptation I get in the cardiovascular system. But I want to do that as I'm aging at least five times a week. I want to be able to get that. And I'm looking for 15 to 30 minutes a day. It doesn't have to be continuous. It can be a discontinuous thing where I do 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes. doesn't matter. What you're looking for is a stretch on the heart because that's going to get the cardiovascular adaptation. So if we're looking to do that as our basic component, that's going to do you know most of the cardiovascular work. And then at least one time a day, I want people to work hard. No matter how old they are, I want them to work hard, be at a, be out of breath. So be at a point where they're struggling to, they wouldn't be able to hold a conversation. So you need to go hard at least once a week, as far as the cardiovascular component goes. And then what I would suggest is, what I would propose is two times a week you're going to lift. And when I say we're going, you know, what I say when we're going to lift is we're going to lift, and it's not going to be oh you're old we're going to lift a light weight. We're going to lift a heavy weight because heavy weight, we know this is important for strength. And the second thing we're gonna do is we're gonna lift that weight to failure. And that, again, does those two things. It activates every motor unit, so every muscle fiber within the muscle, and that's gonna give us the biggest stimulus to grow the muscle. And the second thing it does is those last repetitions are gonna be super slow. Those super slow repetitions, those are gonna improve the health of the tendons that are related to the muscle. So now what we're gonna do is we're going to get both tendon health, muscle size, and muscle strength in those two workouts a week where we're trying to target the whole body in those two workouts. And so really what we're looking to do is we're looking to have both of those components within kind of a program that's going to be something that people can do for a long time. And then talk about maybe diet as well. Yeah, so so dietarily, again, a lot of that is going to be, it's going to be so individual. Um, And I'm not somebody who thinks that there's one diet that fits everybody um, because there isn't. Um, What is satiating to me and it's going to stop me from eating more, which is the key component, is not going to be the same as it is going to be for you or for Zach or anybody else. The key thing becomes if you've got a propensity for something, that's when you maybe change your diet. Like if I were to find out today that, okay, you've got, you now have cancer, I would be on a ketogenic diet immediately because I know that what it's going to do is it's going to decrease that cancer's development. I'm also going to do the other things that we talked about. I'm going to do the endurance exercise and the strength because I know that if I'm fighting cancer, the stronger I am, the longer I'm going to live because fully 30% of people who die from cancer actually die from the cachexia, the muscle wasting that comes from the disease. So if I can prevent that wasting, I can maintain my strength and longevity. So, but the diet to me is, is going to be a component that's so individual. It's the goal is to find something that's going to work for you. If you've got, you know, if you've got specific things that are, that are really problematic, then I can't say, oh yeah, you should be on this ketogenic diet. Many people actually find that they, they eat just as much on a ketogenic diet as, as on a different diet. In our mice, what we had to do so we had to limit the, the amount of food they got. So they all got the same number of calories. Because if we just gave them free access, they would eat more of the ketogenic because it was more palatable. And so, so again, part of diet is finding something that at the right number of calories, you feel satisfied. Um, and that's really the challenge because it's completely individual. And would you say, do, would you have any recommendations with regard to protein, regardless of, of dietary style? Yeah, so, so I would say that there is really good evidence that if you want to maintain your protein mass, that you're, you want to be eating 
as a young person, that 0.25 grams per kilogram body weight at each meal, so three to four times a day, where you're eating that at breakfast, because that's the hardest meal for people to eat protein a lot of time. And then as you get older, you're shifting up the protein in the meals without increasing the caloric content, actually decreasing the caloric content, which means the percentage of protein in your diet has to come up. And so there we're shifting up to around 0.4 grams per kilogram body weight in each meal will be ideal. The statement you made regarding, uh, you know, saying that uh, if, if you were concerned about cancer, you would definitely go on a ketogenic diet would be considered controversial by many people. What, by what reason do you, do you make that statement? Because that's the one that I know that has the ability to, at least in every, all the work that we've done, have this global effect of decreasing mTOR activity throughout the whole body. And so that's the component that I would be looking for with that. You know, the way that, you know, everything else is just personal, but those things where you're going to say, look, what we've seen is that when we feed an animal a ketogenic diet, if I take out the liver, mTOR activity is much, much lower. That's what I'm looking for when I'm, when I'm saying that, that if I had a cancer, that cancer is going to need these, these proteins that we want to use to build muscle. The cancer needs it to build the tumor. And if, if I want to do that, there's, you know, that's the way that I would do it. You could also potentially do it by limiting the protein con component of the diet by going onto a, a very low protein diet, and that would potentially work as well. I don't know if you're familiar with the work of uh, Professor Thomas Seyfried. I think he's out of Boston College. We had him on earlier, and he is a proponent of more or less ketogenic style diets as well, but he's concerned about glucose based on the work of, uh, uh, I forget the guy from the 20s, Otto, uh, Right. I forget his name now, but anyway, he got the Nobel Prize. But anyway, he's concerned about glucose uptake and then glutam glutamine uptake as well. But I mean, that's a different talk. A different way to attack it is from the mTOR angle. So I think it's very interesting. Yeah. Otto, yeah. Otto Warburg, that's who it was. <laughs> One other thing I wanted to ask about, because I think we, we really kind of covered a lot about the skeletal muscle and the nutrition component to that. And how does that, especially when we're talking about the elderly population, you know, the thing I get the most concerned about is that kind of progressive degeneration of muscle strength as well as like bone density. And then ultimately it's like, a, there's a trip and there's a falls, so there's a broken hip, broken leg or something like that, that just keeps them from being even as active as they were before for a long enough period of time. By the time they kind of come out the back end of that, it's um, very difficult, if not impossible for them to kind of get back to a activity level that's going to be lucrative for staying alive. Um, so how does like kind of that bone density component fit in with the skeletal muscle and the protein consumption? Is that something that you can think of as being when you're doing the right protein, uh, right protein nutrition and the right strength things, are we going to assume that the bone density component is also going to be addressed with that? So to some degree from, from Mike Crenny's work, we know that, Every time you eat a protein-based meal, you're gonna have an increase in protein synthesis within the bone and it's quite robust. The big thing with a lot of these responses, and one of the reasons why we get less responsive as we get older is we lose some of the insulin sensitizing proteins. Some of the proteins that are important in the response to insulin. And it, in these situations, what insulin is doing is not really say, just that it's driving uptake. What it's doing is it's shunting blood. And what insulin is doing is shunting blood to the tissues where you can store sugars and fats and proteins. That's going to be your fat and your, and your muscle and to some degree to your bones. And so what we're looking at is we're looking to, you know, especially in older individuals, we're looking to use the exercise as a way that we target the nutrition to the areas that we're interested in. And so one of the things that's clear is that, that people um, really have a, a not really come to understand how bone, um, bone really responds to loading. And it responds to loading very different than our other tissues, it, at least to our skeletal muscle. And so there's, Roblin and Burr did these beautiful studies. What they did was they looked to see how many loads of a bone it took in order to maximize the ability to increase bone density. And what they found is that already by the time you loaded a bone 40 times, that you had no greater, if you loaded it 400 times, there's no greater benefit. 
again, so it's like the protein. You can eat, continue to eat protein, but at, you get to a certain point and there's no beneficial effect to doing more. If you're talking about a bone, it doesn't take much load, but you have to have a relatively, it doesn't take many loadings, but it takes a, a, a relatively good impact force. And so already by a few minutes of, of a jumping exercise, your bones are already maximally turned on to be able to now synthesize protein and make the bones stronger. That's a very, you know, again, it's not well understood. And so in somebody like yourself, who's an ultra runner, you're going to go out for a three hour run, your muscles, your heart are all responding for three hours, but your tendons, your bones, and your cartilage stopped responding after about five minutes, 10 minutes into the exercise. And then what you're doing is you're increasing the mechanical loads, which is causing mechanical fatigue on these tissues, but you're not getting any more stimulus for the adaptation. And so when we're talking about trying to maintain our bone mass or grow our bone mass, there's beautiful studies from Japanese groups that show that if you have a bunch of girls jump as high as they can six times a day, three times a week, their bone mineral density and their bone mass goes up. So you don't need a lot of load for your bone, but you do need those loads. And what, again, what do we do with our older people? Oh no, we can't, you know, we have to have controlled movements. They can't move. So all we're doing is we're completely underloading this mechanically sensitive tissue. Whereas what we should be doing is six times a day, jump as high as you can. And it's gonna go down, it's not gonna be very high for an older person, but what you're gonna do is you're gonna get that impact force. And now that impact force is gonna say, okay, that's wonderful. Now we're gonna have enough of a stimulus from those six to 40 jumps that you do, that now we're gonna make more bone as well. And we're not gonna be as good at making bone when we're old as we are when we're young, but at least the stimulus is going to be there. And so we, one of, I think the biggest problems as we get older is we, we really put all of our, our elderly into these that we want to protect them like they're, they're our kids. Like we want to protect them from injury. The result is we just accelerate their, their rate of decline. Yeah. And it sounds like, um, you know, in your explanation, it's something that's pretty easy for almost anyone to implement into their schedule. It's not a huge time suck or anything like that. So if you start that routine early, carry it into your older age, and then you're probably in the best spot you could be. Yep. Yeah. And the best time to do it is when there's, when you're, it's like if you're going to be sitting at a desk for eight hours, four hours into it, stand up, jump as high as you can 10 times, and that's going to be a great stimulus for your bone. You sit down and you do the rest of your day. Now what you've got is you've got the perfect situation because bone adapts short periods of load with long periods of rest, about eight, six to eight hours of rest in between them. So if you were going to do in your training, you were going to do a long run this, this afternoon. First thing in the morning, you get up and jump rope for five minutes. And what that's going to do is it's going to give your bones, your tendons, your, and your cartilage a stimulus so that they adapt. Eight hours later, six hours later, when you go to run, they'll get a second small stimulus at the beginning, but then the fatiguing stimulus over time. But that protective session that you've added in has the potential to improve your bone, your tendons, and your cartilage to a much greater degree. Yeah, it's great information, and, and that's one of the things that I, I've, I've talked about a number of times that's so important for particularly older, older folks to maintain some of those explosive type activities. And so I, I, in, in my own personal training, I do quite a bit of jumping. I do quite a bit of plyometric work. I do quite a bit of aggressive med ball throws, and I got that from a throwing background and then in the, some of the other sports, but I think it's nice to see some of the science behind why that is important because most of us, you know, we, we spent so many time, you know, in the jogging mindset, you know, walking on the treadmill, jogging on the treadmill for – decades and now finally people are starting to at least start to do a little bit more resistance training you see a shift towards that but it's also important to maintain this bone stimulating you know loads like that which 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 can be accomplished by a small jumps and stuff like that so i think that's great great actual information thank you very much yeah no worries well, I unfortunately have to go do a consultation here, guys. So I appreciate it, Dr. Barr, for coming on. This has been a wonderful, uh, very, very uh, uh, stimulating conversation. I think it's going to uh, help quite a few people. Uh, let people know where they might find you, where to look out for you. If you've got anything coming up people need to know about, we'd really appreciate to hear about it. Yeah, so, so I'm, I have a Twitter account. It's uh, at Muscle Science. So I got in early, so I got a good handle. 
So that was pretty good. Um, and then, yeah, so when we have papers and we have other things that are coming out, we, um, we do a little bit of promotion on there, tell people a little bit about the papers. Um, the other thing that we try and do is we try and when there's good papers that come out and they're from other people, we try and highlight those things as well, because it's really important to, to, um, to understand when good work comes out and when it changes how we think about our responses, um, how our muscles and our musculoskeletal system respond to, to an exercise or a nutritional or an aging stimulus. And so we like to try and do it that way is just try and keep people, um, give people a little information through that, through that mode. Well, Graham, we've had we've had guys like Stu Phillips, Don Lehman, and uh, Jose Antonio on. We'll you, add you to another list of uh, very uh, very helpful uh, protein and muscle friendly uh, researchers because I think that's that's a, such an important message. So thanks again for coming on. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks a lot for having me. Take care, Keith. Thanks a lot. Take care. Hey, folks! Human Performance Outliers podcast is growing. And due to the growth, we are looking to take on some new sponsors. So if you feel like your company or organization would be a good fit for our audience, please do not hesitate to reach out to hpopodcast at gmail.com. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast with hosts Dr. Sean Baker and Zach Bitter. If you enjoyed the show, please consider following us on social media and checking out our websites. Links to those can be found in the show notes. Also, if you have any questions or comments, please do not hesitate to shoot us an email at hpopodcast at gmail.com. Thanks again for tuning into the show.